Greetings, sore friends. Today we'll review the Albion Prince, a high-end reproduction of a lay medieval arming sword. First, let's look at the definition of an arming sword. Well, to put it simply, an arming sword is a medieval European double-edged straight sword. Throughout the ages, there has been numerous changes and revisions to this design, but they remained the iconic cruciform with its cross guard and the pummel at the end. Army swords were the choice of sidearm from monarchs and nobilities all the way down to commoners. So this particular example, the Albion Prince, is designed by Swedish legendary sources and also Peter Johnson after he examined hundreds of examples and handled them at museums and private collections. The Albion Prince is classified as an Oakshaw type 16 sword that were popular around the first half of the 14th century. The 20th century sword collector, historian and illustrator Jörg Oakshaw has done some extensive research on the medieval swords and he developed a typology to document the evolution of medieval double-edged swords as a continuation to the typology developed by Dr. John Patterson for swords of the Viking Age. Regional variations existed but were generally less prominent than the changes over time to adapt to the development of armored warfare and even the social structures in the Middle Ages. It could also reflect the advancement of the metallurgical technology and the automation process in the medieval industry, such as the methodology of grinding and the polish of the blade. So you will observe that in later medieval times, certain types of blade profile and cross-section became more popular and also the spring temper of the blade became more reliable and more conducive to creating more durable blades. Also the general profile and the rigidity of the blade will also conform to the reality of armored combat in the medieval times. To understand the design of Oakshaw Type 16 armoring sword, we have to look at the context of its usage. Primarily, it was used in two sets of circumstances. One being the, the armored self-defense situations in the civil context, namely the popular sword and armor combat, a very common form of self-defense practice universally from um, the 13th to the 15th century by almost everyone in society. Uh, all the way from monarchs and nobilities uh, down to commoners in the streets. It's a very convenient way to carry your sidearm in civil context. And a sword usually involved is a lightweight sword that can be easily paired with a small buckler like this one over here. It's quick enough but still has enough authority to deliver debilitating blows with one hit to end the fight and of course save your life. The Albion Prince falls directly into the subtype of Oakshot Type 16, which is one of the popular types of practice with sword and buckler. The other context of this usage is a battleground situation, and in this case, it's almost always carried as a sidearm to complement uh, primary weapons like pole axes, pole hammers, halberds, pikes, lenses, or longbows and crossbows. When you lose your primary weapon or your auto ammo for uh, longbows and crossbows, or you get into a close quarter melee with your enemy, you are expected to draw your sidearm and engage in skirmish assist your men at arms uh, and other heavy armored infantry, of course. So one trait of this kind of sword is obviously um, the ease of carrying. It has to reside at your side, not uh, being very intrusive to uh, the operation of your primary weapon. And when you do draw it, it has to be effective, which is the reason that adopt this form starting from the early 14th century 
in the Oakshot Type 16 sword were very popular in the first half of the 14th century. The reason that it takes this form in the blade, the profile, uh, with a rather broad base and tapers to a acute point, is this demand to be used uh, as a sword most effective in cuts and thrusts. And what's the context of warfare, and specifically armor, uh, the development of armor in the first half of the 14th century? Well, it's usually considered by historians as a transitional period between the age of male armor and the period of full plate armor. So you see, by the very end of the medieval age, plate armor encapsulating wearers from head to toe was increasingly prevalent and it offers amazing protections. Before that, uh, prior to the 13th century, most heavily armored combatants in the battlefield were heavy males. So don't think of this kind of male armor as medium or light armor. They are indeed the heaviest configuration of the day. They had uh, chains or rings that's very thick and durable, which has very tiny openings in the, in the center. So it offers amazing protection against cuts. Knights uh, were covered from head to toe with male armor and uh, usually a great help. But beginning from the 14th century, it seems to be a transition between the pure male configuration to plate armor. In the beginning, we see on many burial monuments or effigies that knights start to add plate protections to their limbs at first, maybe simpler forms of splintered armor uh, with metal strips affixed, usually riveted to a leather backing or, or canvas. And then you see foot plate, greaves, paulines, and sometimes in the upper limbs as well, smaller shoulder plates, not fully developed pauldron, but smaller plates covering the shoulders and the elbows. This will make cuts even less effective against these areas. Uh, even though it doesn't offer the kind of protection a full plate harness did in 15th century or in 16th century, uh, where a sword blow would just not have any impact at all against a plate armor wearer if you hit in an area protected by the plate, which is almost 99% of your body. In the 14th century, especially in the first half, um, many areas of your body were still protected by male armor, but consider that if you're adding plate components to this area of your body, you have to reduce the weight of the male armor. The rings linked together will have to be thinner and have bigger openings. The overall integrity and density of the mesh will have to be lower, so it will be less rigid under articulated plates, which will make male inevitably more vulnerable to piercing attacks, but it's a compromise that must be made. So you still retain a certain mobility in combat. And these areas, using lighter male components, were to be exploited by swords with certain thrusting capacity. If you do a comparison of this source profile uh, with an earlier form of arming sword, like this old shot type 12 arming sword, used mostly in the 12th and 13th century, uh, which is considered to be the high medieval age. This is a typical knight's arming sword, knightly sword. Well, uh, the most obvious part is even though their blade lengths uh, are very comparable, you see the profile of the earlier arming swords have this edges, they are not exactly parallel to each other, but they're not tapered as much as the later swords. So the point is obviously less acute. Uh, they are less conducive to thrusting. Also, um, the blade tends to be thinner on earlier swords. So 
they're more flexible. Obviously, a less rigid blade is less conducive to stiff thrusting. So, on the upper portion of the blade of earlier swords, you can see it's still very broad. That's obviously to uh, optimize the cutting capacity near the tip. So you can deliver more effective cuts uh, from further away that effectively uh, uh, increase your reach, as I talked about earlier. Heavily armored knights were encased from head to toe in mail armor. However, the majority of the combatants in the battlefield were still wearing lighter forms of protections. Uh, they could not afford this kind of heavy mail armor that knights and mobility did. So, they wear mostly gambisons, which is a very tough of textile protection. If you look at some of the tests done to this uh, kind of armor with accurate modern reproductions, you see that the layers of hardened linen and felt can offer other reliable protection against cuts from blades and to a certain degree thrusting as well. Because you have to consider the human target is um, not a very rigid target. Uh, you have soft tissues. Uh, you also are not fixed to the ground, so you tend to move, especially when you uh, suffer kind of an impact from cuts and thrusting. So, a cut centric sword is very essential to battlefield scenarios where you have to bypass the toughened linen and fell, sometimes cotton, and still do enough damage which is not easy at all. So swords in early medieval times tend to focus on cutting capacity to optimize it. Keep in mind that you have to keep your edges razor sharp to bypass this kind of textile protection. As time progressed, medieval sword makers endeavored to find new solutions to retain comparable cutting capacity while improving the thrusting potential by experimenting different cross-sections of sword blades. You see, in earlier periods, sword blades tended to be relatively thin while taking on a lenticular cross-section to ensure the integrity and durability despite being overall thinner and more flexible. In later medieval times, technology had allowed swords to evolve and take on a diamond cross-section with a full flat ground from a very prominent central ridge to the edge. So. The blade doesn't have a lot of extra meat, extra material to back up, yet it's very effective in cutting, even though the blade on the upper portion may not be very thin. The blade bevel is very conducive to cutting. Also, the rigidity added by the central ridge will help, and this more acutely tapered blade will be very effective in thrusting into the gap of plate armor into these weaker male components, such as the voider or the male standard in the neck, you obviously cannot afford wearing heavier male components in this area. Otherwise, uh, it will restrain your movement and mobility. So to exploit this kind of weakness, you need more acute points. This offers a certain understanding of the form and the design of the Oakshop Type 16 sword. In later medieval times, the blade evolved further and they tend to take on a diamond cross section with hollow ground geometry, so a kind of concave uh, right in, in the blade to address the weight. So the blade can still have certain width uh, to be effective in cutting, but the hollow ground geometry will be very helpful in cutting while maintaining a very sick, prominent central ridge to maintain a um, very stiff blade. So the Type 16 sword is the perfect middle of road medieval sword. It has a very average weight length, usually from 30 inches to 34 inches, 70 to 80 centimeter. It has a medium width puller from the base of the blade to, to the center or to two-thirds of the blade fence. 
reduce certain weight from the blade while being relatively rigid. It handles rather lively, but not the lightest kind of sword, obviously. Still carry enough assorting to do more than enough damage in one debilitating blow. Overall, this specimen of the Albion Prince weighs 1132 grams, which is almost exactly two and a half pounds, with a 32 inch long blade, and the overall lens of 39 inches. It also usually takes this very stereotypical medieval sword's cruciform, namely with a straight or slightly curved crossguard, and usually with a wheel pommel, some variant of a wheel pommel. Let's take a look at the fit and finish of this Albion Prince. First of all, let's talk about the pommel, which is the most unique part on this specimen. You see, the Albion Prince has this uh, faceted variant of the type K pommel with a pin block. It has a very attractive color and a very carefully tapered profile. It has eight facets. It has this central recess for you to place your unique pommel markers or coins. And in this case, two cross botany were placed in the center of this recess. The pommel markers are made by Brian Coons of DDK Source. It has the bronze look to match the overall aesthetics of the pommel, and it goes well with the color of the grip. It fits very well the design of a high status weapon. Uh, it's hand finished, hand ground, to have the final polish. Obviously, um, it doesn't have the perfect symmetry, but that's historically accurate pure swords. Overall, I would say that it's very symmetrical, very nice looking. Obviously, coming from Albion, they are famous for this level of detail. And you can see the tan going through the pin block with a very clean finish. Overall, it's very well done. I'm very happy about this pommel, very fond of this look. And also, usually, Medieval pommels on medieval swords can be a little bit intrusive in your handling. When you do a hand-shaped grip, also I want to demonstrate this. The dimension of the real pommel, it doesn't come into interference with your hand at all. The curvature of the, the wheel from the edges to the central recess is very scientific. So when you extend your arm, these uh, wrist power cutting, all the powered motions, it doesn't rub on your palm at all. Very comfortable. All the edges on the cross guard is chamfered. There's no discomfort at all. It doesn't bite into your skin. So, very well done. Let's take a look at the grip. The grip is four inches long. It has a tapered profile and it has this uh, octagonal cross section, which is very ergonomic, very comfortable to handle with. Also, aesthetically speaking, it's very appealing. In the center, you see three risers, so that will offer plenty of traction to your hand. Your hand will not slip up and down intentionally. See a riser just below the pommel and another one just above the cross guard. Both the aesthetics and the functionality uh, are very appealing, I will say. The leather wrapping is done on top of very even cord wrapping, and the leather is batch tanned with this very tastefully done antique blue color. The coloring is very subtle in certain lighting condition. It appears to be just black, but under the sun, it's obviously antique blue. The grip also has this expertly done wrapping. That's wrapped from one direction uh, on top of the wooden core and the core wrapping, and then counter wrap from the other direction. So the thickness remain even on all sides. Just by handling it, it's incredibly difficult to tell where the termination of the leather wrapping is. The wooden core of the grip is made of stabilized birch, so wood expansion and shrinkage are not a problem on this Albion sword. Overall, this grip is a little bit thin. Although, if you just look at the picture, the proportion is very good. I will say that probably to most people, this grip feels kind of thinner 
that it has to be, but in handling, it's not very uncomfortable at all. And one thing is that the vag tan of this grip tend to rub the color on my hand. I'm not sure whether you can see there is a blue tint kind of residue when I handle the sword. That's not necessarily an issue, but something to be aware of. Move on to the cross guard. The entire hilt is based on one example from Oakshot's record from medieval swords, a specimen of the Type 14 sword. The Type 14 sword uh, were popular around the same time as Type 16 sword. Sometimes it's a little bit difficult to differentiate. You see here I have this Type 14 sword designed by Angus Trim. The profile of these two swords are not dissimilar at all, except that Type 16 swords tend to be longer on average than Type 14 sword. Keep in mind that the specimen uh, that features this hilt design is a Type 14 sword with a blade uh, of 33 inches. And Type 14 swords generally have a broader base, usually have a swell near the cross guard. They tend to have a more abrupt transition to the tip than the Type 16 sword. You can probably see here, uh, near the tip, it has this very obvious transition not seen on the Type 16 sword. Still, they are very similar, and sometimes uh, there is quite a bit of confusion between the two types. Although Type 16 swords tend to be longer, you have to remember that the example of Type 14 sword that uh, feature this hilt has a 33 inch blade, so that's very comparable to the blade on this Albion Prince. Now let's look at the cross guard in detail. It's a very flamboyant Type 1 cross guard, relatively slim cross section of a curved cross guard. It's not very extreme, obviously, only a slight curvature is observed. This example here has this very prominent central ridge or raised section and a hexagonal cross-section that tapers down all the way to the extremities. So just before the termination, it transitions into a square cross-section. So it offers the air of elegance, certain sophistication, of course, to match the seam of a high-status weapon. I also appreciate the shape of this central ridge on the cross-guard. So it's very natural when you do sun grip control the flat of the sword in these sword cow motions very comfortable there's no transition that feels jarring to your hand and it's also very easy to index the edge alignment the historical sword that featured this hilt the tar hilt including the pommel and the grip and the cross guard uh, is now housed at the national museum of denmark in Copenhagen. the blade on that sword is slightly different uh, like I said, it's a Type 14 sword. This blade, however, features a very typical diamond cross section with a uh, full flat ground from the central ridge on the upper portion of the blade and the fuller on the lower part. Like I mentioned earlier, it's very conducive to clean cutting, obviously, and it doesn't carry any additional material on the blade. Unlike the earlier lenticular cross section, on swords in earlier medieval times. The edges are sharpened to a fine edge, enough to slice paper, but not overly done to jeopardize its durability. The edges of the fullers are perfectly straight and rather crisp. However, although the fullers terminate on the same spot on both sides of the plate, the terminations are somewhat muddy instead of being well-defined. This may be inspired by some of the purest finds, but personally, I would prefer cleanly defined fuller terminations. The finish on the blade is very clean, uh, with an incredibly even high satin finish. All four planes are quite flat, with minimal surface rippling, which is difficult to achieve, as it is quite time consuming, so even many high-end custom smiths uh, cannot get this right. Massive credit to Albion, as this takes a lot of time and effort to get right on blades, hand polished with sending belts. The blade features strong distal tapering. The thickness is 4.7 millimeters at the base, and brought down to 3.2 millimeters. 
at the center of the blade, 2.6 at the point of percussion, and 2.3 millimeters at two inches from the tip. Combined with the prominent profile taper, the mass on the blade is wonderfully distributed, therefore the sword is balanced beautifully. The center of gravity is at four and a half inches or 10.8 centimeters from the guard. The point enjoys great control with elegance and grace while the blade cuts with authority. Those edges are very straight, of course. No warping system at all. This is very uh, typical for Albion swords. With a very careful finish and excellent heat treat as well. The transition to the tip is very well done. Except that near the tip region, there's a little bit of an asymmetry. I have observed certain um, imperfection on other Albion stores as well, given that there are uh, high-end reproductions, usually we expect less of this issue, but they do exist uh, from example to example. A little bit disappointing, so to speak. Um, this one I purchased from a senior collector on a, a forum. Um, he owns, at a certain point, probably 70 or 80 Albion stores, as well as other high-end reproductions. I'm not sure whether something happened uh, on his watch. I suspect not, because uh, this kind of issues are indeed observed on other Albion stores. I'm not overly upset about it, but it, it is a little mm, noticeable when you have a closer look at the sword. Otherwise, the blade is flawless. There's no any imperfections. As always, the gap between the blade and the cross guard is very small. This is very difficult to execute. Although on his sword called Regents, you don't always find this kind of finish. Uh, on medieval swords, you can even find a recess in the cross guard for the blade to sit in. So there wouldn't be any play um, between the blade and the hill components when you handle it, which is highly crucial. Also, it tends to stop rain and blood that goes into the hill. As usual, the cross guard fit is very, very good on Albion swords. And you can barely see the gap between the cross guard and the blade. The entire blade is made of 6150 high carbon spring steel, which is always the choice for high-end makers these days. Uh, it is tempered to a harness of uh, Rockwell scale C of 54 to 56, so it's rather hard for a medieval sword. The blade gives a nice ringtone when you knock on it. Flex the blade, it demonstrates a certain degree of flexibility, yet it's not already done. So, thrusting is still very effective, but it can sustain certain kind of impact, when, especially when the edge alignment is poor. The Albion swords never come with any scabbers. They used to produce some Yi Hao scabbers before for their swords, but now they just have three affiliated uh, craftsmen working on the spec scabbers um, as they have all of their models in store so you don't have to ship your sword to them uh, for them to work on it. Uh, they are Christian Flesher, Ryan Coombs, and Haas from England. The scabbers are usually high value items that generally takes months to craft and years to, for you to wait after you place the commission. I'm currently working with Brian Coombs for the scabbard and the bell suspension system for this sword. And you can take a look at his previous work um, for him on the design and the pathway choose. 
now we come down to the inevitable question of whether it is worth it. The short answer is yes. And I will provide a more nuanced, long answer. To me personally, uh, it is unequivocally worth it. However, your mileage may definitely vary as um, it is a high value item and more importantly, you have to wait for a year or so after you place the condition percent. This is generally longer than some, some of their peers in the industry, such as arms and armor, locked with swords, as Albion has accumulated quite a backlog due to their popularity. And you have to wonder how many one years does a sword collector have in their life? Even though it's personally worth it, I'm not going to go out and order 50 of them tomorrow, that's for sure. Make no mistake, there are nice things, wonderful swords for collectors who value the historical accuracy, uh, the faithfulness to the originals, both in terms of handling and uh, aesthetics. I have to say that Albion swords are basically spot on in these departments. If you are a practitioner of uh, historical European martial arts and you want to handle a sword that's as close as it can possibly be to some of the um, animals held by knights and nobles in the Middle Ages, well, Albion is a very legitimate choice if you don't want to go custom, obviously. Uh, as the cost and the waiting time is very comparable. So there you go. The Albion Prince, I give it a 10 out of 10. It is not flawless, of course. A few of their Albion swords are, but it is worth the time of waiting and the price. Hope you find this review interesting and helpful. If so, please like and subscribe.